All right, well, let's, uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Dear God, please help us. Lord, in knowledge and wisdom, all of us infants, please help us by your good spirit, bring scripture to mind and make this a time of edification. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, instead of me determining uh, just kind of what road we're going to go down, I do have some things that I would like to share, but I always like to open it up, first of all, to questions. This would be questions about missions or ministry or ministry and family or anything that has to do with with that. So if there's no questions, I'll just preach. So question. So somebody who's aspiring to the ministry or may want to go into it, they see the difficulty of it and they're wondering if it's worth the cost. How do you well, how do you improve? Well, uh, it is worth the cost, but if you are called, you will either surrender to it or die. Um, if you're truly called, it's one area where there's no games to be played. Um, and you know that. But it is a very, very serious matter. Now, with regard to the cost, it can be great, but um, the greatness is all, always comparative, isn't it? Like, I'm pretty tall because LeBron James is not standing here. If he was standing here, I wouldn't be very tall. So it's comparative. So when I look at the cost of ministry compared to what Paul describes for me in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the love of Christ constraining him. And he doesn't mean his love for Christ, but Christ's love for him. So when I look at what Christ has done for me, whatever cost is thrown before me is nothing. Another thing is very interesting, and I, I heard this from one preacher about one thing, and then I kind of sat down and saw, wow, this applies everywhere. You know, when Jesus looked at the rich young ruler and he said, sell everything you have, give it to the poor and come and follow me. Well, that's an amazing demand. But do you realize that Christ was not asking him to do anything that Christ himself hadn't done? Though he was rich, he made himself poor. And the, the ramifications of this, implications of it, is just absolutely incredible. Let me give you an example. A man has a wife that genuinely, uh, out of not his fault, does not love him, is mean-spirited, uh, rejects him, and everything else. And he needs a reason for going on in that marriage. Again, Jesus is not asking him to do anything he didn't do. He loved his bride when his bride didn't love him. He sought her when she was soiled. I mean, I, I, I've tried now since I heard that statement several months ago, I've tried to go through and find one thing Jesus has asked me to do that he hasn't done. I can't find it. And that's our motivation. Now, I'll tell you one last thing. There have been so many times when you can't find motivation in yourself, in the fruit of your ministry, or even in those people who supposedly you're supposed to serve. But the thing that keeps you from walking out the door is the crucified one. This is all for him. Um, if you're preaching, like when you go to the mission field, you know, and you go out into a plaza and you begin to preach with your little bullhorn or your pulpit and your tracks and Man, everything seems to be going well. People are listening. God, Satan will always raise up one person. Demon possessed. I don't know what they are. They just start screaming at you. And guess what? The whole crowd turns on you. Who would have thought? The whole crowd turns on you and they throw you and your tracks and your little bullhorn out in the street and laugh at you. It's going to take a lot more than love for people to have you pick all that stuff back up and walk back into the plaza again. You know, I'm reminded of the Moravian boys. May the lamb, shall the lamb not have the full, receive the full reward for his suffering. So that's why we go in to the ministry. The other thing, realize it's just the great privilege. Spurgeon, uh, I believe, borrowing from Martin Luther, hit it right on the head. If someone, if you're called to be Christ's minister and you're asked to be king, 
How dare you step down from such a high position to such a low one? So. Here's the thing, almost everything is cured by growing in your knowledge of God. Those who know God, they know their God, they will be strong. They will do great things because they know him. You see, during the covid, like people are going, what's God doing? What's God doing? It's almost like when you start asking that question, you're trying to hold God hostage. What do I mean? God, I'm going to be miserable, sad, broken and doubting until you meet my demands, which are you tell me what's going on. For the most part, God is not going to tell you what's going on. Why? Well, here's the reason. I have a friend uh, many years in Peru. He, he was so faithful to me, put his life in jeopardy. I mean, just you name it. He showed faithfulness. If he walked in those doors right now and said, just screamed out, throw me the keys to your Jeep. I'd throw him the keys to my Jeep. And you would say, well, why are you doing that? You don't know what he's going to do with your Jeep. Well, I don't know what he's going to do with my Jeep. I don't have to because I know him. And I know whatever he does with my Jeep will be right. You don't need to know what God's doing ever. You just need to know who God is. If he is who he says he is, whatever he's doing is right. And so it all comes back down to the character of God. Is there another question? Okay, we'll preach then. Okay, there's one. Can you share a little bit on, on stewardship and responsibility at home in the ministry? Yeah, Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's, it's all right there. The will of God is perfect. It's perfect. So, I'm a single missionary. I have the liberty to work 18 hours a day in the ministry. I'm a single missionary. I am dead to those commands about a wife and family. And those commands are dead to me. They, they make no demands upon me. None. The moment I take a wife, there's a whole bunch of commands that wake up. And you should know commands take time. Obedience to them takes time. So if I'm going to, let's say I'm an obedient single missionary and I'm working 18 hours a day in the ministry, 16 hours a day in the ministry. And now I have a wife. I have to allocate enough time to this wife to fulfill God's commands with regard to a wife. Then when children come, I have to allocate more time to those children. Now, if you say, if you say, you know, I'm going to like I've heard preachers to sacrifice my family on the altar of service to God, uh, you're actually doing the same thing Adam did. You're blaming God. You're saying your will is not perfect. Therefore, you've put me in a position, God, where I have to disobey you in in this area in order to obey you in this area. That's not true. But what is coming out is that you are self-willed. And you don't qualify as an elder. You're self-willed. Your ambition is ministry. And your ambition is not the will of God. You see, if in God's providence, and I trust in the overarching providence of God, I have been given a wife, I am to allocate time to her. And if I don't, I'm a disobedient man and disqualified for the ministry. See, the, 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 guys, you're going to see such a flip-flop. Do you honestly think like my number one work is is dealing with missionaries every day? That's that's what I do. All right. But, you know, I'm asked to do really big conferences. Do you really think that's some kind of a mark? Of having arrived. Do you really think that's impressive to God? Really? I mean, are you that carnal? Matter of fact, I think sometimes COVID is God's judgment on Reformed Bible conferences. What about the guy who labors with the average 75 to 100 people for 50 years of his life as a real pastor? Now, I'm not just saying this to be cute. I believe it. 
on the day of judgment. What a flip flop. And you young men need to understand that. Here's a philosophical question. Would God. Why would God take the most beautiful rose he ever made and plant it in a forest through which no man, no angel, no sentient being ever walked? How does God get glory from that rose? No one sees it. He gets glory from the rose because he sees it every day. Every day. And he delights in what he has made. So your only concern is hiddenness and obedience in the simple commands. That's it. That's your only concern. That's it. Any other question? Yes, sir. Can you speak on catechizing people that are in this law and have God kind of back and personal going to them and explaining things to them as opposed to like small groups? Yeah. Wow, that's a big question. And here's why. Um, I can only see in the, look, let me show you something. Um, look at First Timothy. And Chapter three. Now, I have said I've made a statement that has made a lot of people mad, but I'm going to say it again because it's so true. I say I know Arminians who are far more reformed than you reform guys. Now, I am Calvinistic and the Reformation was principally Calvinistic. So but the point I'm trying to make is we've gone through 15 years of a lot of young men thinking they were reformed because they had intellectually grasped some form of a Calvinistic soteriology that does not make you reformed. And I'm using the word reform just because people are using it. I don't necessarily like the word because the reformers didn't call themselves reformers. They just wanted to be biblical. So here's the thing. You and I have no right to do anything except that which is mandated by Scripture. If you want to call that the regulative principle or whatever you want to call it, it's just true. And this demonstrates the lack of the fear of God among preachers, either ignorance or a lack of the fear of God. One of the two. If you look in First Timothy three. Paul says in verse 14, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. How can one know how to conduct himself in the household of God? Through what Paul wrote. Through what is written. Now, let's just go back. How many times in the law, in the Decalogue, do not add to, do not take away? How many times? When Moses is, is given orders to build the tabernacle. God does not say, OK, these are some of the things I want. If you could figure out how you're going to do it, he didn't say that he didn't ask his opinion. He didn't ask for a strategy. He didn't ask for him to be inventive. He said, you be careful to do everything that was shown to you on that mountain. Now, if that's with regard to a tabernacle that was only a symbol or a type of a greater reality, how dare ministers take the church and do what they do with them? Now, I'm going to get around to your question, but it's a bigger foundational problem. You see, um, we're going to grow our Sunday school by recruiting teachers and you're going to violate what James said. You're going to violate scripture to do it, aren't you? You're going to recruit Sunday school teachers. Well, we know they're not that good a teacher, but if they start studying, then they'll learn to teach. Oh, really? Who told you that? Who gave you the right to do that? Nobody. You invented that. He said, be very careful. Not many of you be teachers. You see how twisted? Men, I will walk in a room like this where everybody believes they're in a biblical church and I realize that we're not even talking the same language. They don't have a clue what they're talking about. Because you just go ahead and do things. I asked a question one time I had to preach at a a big convention to music ministers. Why on earth they ask me? I can't hold a tune, can't play an instrument. But I thought I'd do this. 
Before I get started with my sermon, I would just like to have just people stand up and give comments. As you music directors studied through from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, pulled out every text on worship and then submitted yourself to that, what are the, some of the things the Lord taught you? Hmm. Nobody had done it. And I said, you do know that God killed two music directors in Leviticus 10, don't you? Do you see? So the kid plays guitar and he's got really nice hair. You're going to be responsible for putting that silly little boy up there. On the day of judgment, you have no idea how fearful this is. A minister should not you should not run from a ministerial calling because of demands. You should run from it because of the one who's giving it. You're a steward. And you can only do that which is written. Nothing else. You have no right, no right. So look here, he says here in verse 15, he calls the church the household of God, the church of the living God. Whenever you hear living God, there's usually a battle going on. God's about to smite somebody. I believe Paul is using this language not just to counter the idolatry in Ephesus. But to say, hey, hold on, this is a God who makes alive and kills. This is a God who goes to war for his own name. This is a God who loves his bride and he, he owned it's his bride. It's his bride. And how do you know how to handle his bride? Only one way. What is written? What is written? Let me share with you. I said this to a group of young men yesterday, I think. So imagine a great and mighty and fearful king is going to go on a long journey and you're his steward. And he loves his, his wife more than anyone else in the kingdom. She's everything to him. So he calls you and he says, here are the decrees that I have set out as absolute monarch. This is what you will do for my wife while I'm gone. You will be held accountable for it. He goes on a long journey. But you as a steward who so loved the king, you realize that the people are getting bored with him. They haven't seen him in a while. And they're getting really bored with his wife because, well, th that plain, simple elegance just don't cut it today. So you dress her up like a whore and you drag her in front of carnal men, hoping to win them back to the king. What will the king do when he returns? He will kill every one of you. That's exactly what evangelicalism is today. That's exactly what it's done. And that's why our country is being judged. Because of the preachers. They've dressed up the bride of Christ like a whore. What is it? Oh, we got to make our Sundays to draw them in. Really? If you use carnal means to draw in carnal men, you'll have to continue using carnal means. Now you say, boy, you're using rough language better now than later. The regulative principle, what has God commanded? So let's say that we have a Sunday school and you got all these Sunday school teachers and a lot of them are you've put them in a position where they're teaching heresy. Because they don't even know they're not teachers, but we got to have teachers. OK, make a decision, Bible or. Small groups, small groups can be useful. But I want you to look at something. Do you realize most churches, they have a few men that call themselves elders. Who then do most of the administration and preaching, and then they hire a staff to do what? Pastor, basically, they're not elders, they're staff. So do the people ever come in contact with an elder? When does a child in your church come under the counsel and watch care of an elder? In most churches, not until they're 20, 30, till they get out of singles group. Do you see how you can just start doing things that seem right? And yet there's no biblical grounds for it whatsoever. 
I'm not saying you can't have small groups. What I'm saying is most of the time they're, well, we pastor our people in the small groups. Oh, all the pastors lead a small group? Who's pastoring your people? Somebody else. The tumultuous teenage years. Who's over them? A 19-year-old with really nice hair who plays the guitar. Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise. Why do the boys act like boys? Because that's all they have in their life are boys. And, and look, as, as I've studied, I, I am not an elder. I am under elders. Heart cry is under elders. I am not an elder. Why are you not an elder? People always say that. And I go, well, I... I work under the elders to take care of all the mission things that they have assigned to me and all the things. But, but you ought to be an elder, a preaching elder. I said, so there are preaching elders who don't pastor? <laughs> I'm like a hired gun? What, what? No. An elder is an elder is an elder. You know, I, I saw in one church, elder of marketing. What? No, the, look, just realize something. What everybody thinks is the big thing is not the big thing at all. They're wrong. It's the pastor. It's the pastor. And so if you're going to have those small groups, if you're going to have things like that, you can only do it in a parameter of, OK, who's really caring for the needs of these people? Is it are they elder qualified men? And in when his admonition to the church in Ephesus, all the flock of God, elders are to care for all the flock of God. They don't relegate the teenagers to someone else. Now, now, one elder could say, I feel more inclined for this for a while and really minister to young people. That's fine. But we're talking about the only <laughs> groups we have. As leaders in the church are elders and deacons. I can't find anything else. And, and what, why is everything a mess? Listen, I believe that the epicenter of world missions is the local church. I believe that the leaders of world missions are elders of local churches. Because world missions is just one biblical church with elder qualified men training up other elder qualified men and sending them out to start the same kind of biblical church. It's ecclesiology. You see, and if you look in the book of Acts, it's amazing, isn't it? You see. Apostle, 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 elder, apostle, apostle, elder, elder, apostle, elder, elder. It's like the apostles handed off the baton to elders. Not that elders have apostolic authority or super ecclesiastical authority. No, there are no more apostles. But what we have is elders of local churches. And the responsibility you have is terrifying. To some degree, at least it would be. It will be terrifying if you do not submit your governance of the church. To sola scriptura. Because then you're just running wild, you don't know where you're going. So. Um, elders are going to. Oversee all teaching. There can be a teacher in the church who's gifted, who's not necessarily an elder, but he will be accountable to elders, known by the elders, thoroughly tested by the elders. You could have someone very interested in catechizing. You mainly want to teach that to fathers. It's a good place because you don't want the church to turn into a family and you don't want the family to turn into a church service. And so everything in its proper position, but the elders must they must really be involved. Now, sometimes God will raise up a, a man like a John MacArthur, Charles Spurgeon. There's others. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, where they're the man of the time. And maybe a big flock of people are around them, but they themselves will admit how difficult it is to be biblical 
in that kind of setting. And even though these men that I mentioned, I love every one of them. And I love I love the I love Dr. MacArthur's church and the way the elders work so hard and everything. But they themselves will tell you it's not the norm. It's not what you should be shooting for. It's not what MacArthur was shooting for when he started. <laughs> you see, if God happens to raise you up as the man of the times, wonderful. But the kingdom of heaven literally rests upon churches of 75, 100, 125. And men who pastor them with their name never being known on the planet. You see, and that's what you want to shoot for. Remember, the King Saul, the only thing he ever did right, right was hide behind the baggage. <laughs> if he'd have kept that kind of humble attitude. He would have gone on with the Lord, you see, so. Uh, I teach my children um, and but when so here, here's the thing about um, teaching your devotional time and Dr. Beakey would agree with this and many others is don't turn your devotional time in your family into a church service. I had one guy who told me my children are rejecting the, the, the Bible study we're having, the home devotions. And I said, well, tell me about it. Turned out they were every day about an hour and a half. I said, brother, I would have rejected you. <laughs> you know, I sit down with my children at least four times, usually more a week. And and we go through the Bible. So Romans one. OK, we decided we would take Colossians again a few days ago. So Colossians one, one, my oldest son, read the verse. He reads the verse. I make comments on it. I make questions. OK, my daughter, verse two, she reads it. We usually go through about six verses, takes about 15 minutes. If they want to go longer, we go longer. But if there's no sense of that, that there's nothing, you know, we've gone through the word then we bring it to a close. It's 20 minutes. It's things like that. It's not because it's not a church. The family doesn't replace the church. Uh, catechizing. Um, it's very good. I haven't catechized as much as I wished I had now because uh, but what I did wasn't a bad option. We just went through <laughs> books of the Bible like crazy, but it would have been good to give them more systematic with the catechisms. Um, but one of the good things to do with that is just tell them, OK, memorize this first question. And memorize the verse that goes along with it. And then every two days, three days, I'll sit down with you and let's just go over it. But it's very, very helpful. But brothers, it all starts in the local church. It all starts there. Is there another question? OK, let's look at some things. Um, Have you as a minister? I know some of you studied Greek and Hebrew and all these different things. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever looked up every reference in the Old and New Testaments with regard to the responsibility of a shepherd and made a list? What is a shepherd supposed to do? Have you ever done that? I mean, Think about it. People graduate with master's degrees in pastoral theology or something, and they've never looked at the bad shepherds in Ezekiel. They've never looked at all the way through First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, the other epistles that talk about First Peter, about shepherding, and wrote out every responsibility. Do you realize there's how many how few people have done that? That's why we need a Bob Jennings, man. He had lists, man. Now, now think about that. We have not. Hypocritical men, but we have good men in this country who've graduated with degrees who are pastoring and never once have they gone through the New Testament to look at every text on what is my responsibility as a pastor. Do you see how it's so easy to say we're biblical when actually not even the most elemental worship, for example, 
how many have gone through even the New Testament text with regard to worship and said, OK, whatever's here is how we're going to conform our church. Very few people. A church service. Is there any um, did God just set us free and say, do what you want, or did he say something about the public reading of Scripture about exposition or about my will be a house, my house will be a house of prayer? You see. And um, for example, in our church, and I can talk about our church because I'm it wasn't birthed for me. I'm not an elder there and it's not. You know, it's it's not the end of all things and everyone has to do what we do, but it, you you arrive at 10 o'clock. And there is. A brief scripture reading, maybe a minute, there's an opening prayer and then sometimes one hymn and then there is an hour of prayer. That's not before the morning service, that's part of the morning service. And then there's a five minute break. And then there is a come back together again. There is a reading of scripture, public reading of scripture, usually about a chapter or two chapters, because it says public reading of scripture It doesn't say one verse. There's the public reading of scripture going along, and teaching the people. Being able to say to the people, look, this is why we do public reading of Scripture. And these are the difficulties you're going to encounter. We're not a society who can listen and hear and think. So work at it. We're going to help you work at it. We're going to show you it's not easy because of our culture. But you've got to learn to think as the word of God is being read to you. To hear. To open your ear lids. And so then there's. The, the reading of scripture, then there's the pastoral prayer. It may go on five minutes, 10 minutes. It is. A pastor. Praying for the flock. Praying for his brethren that are in other churches preaching very solemn. Matter of fact, it's one of the most solemn times in our service. And then there's about 50 minutes of exposition and then a meal. And people will come to our church and they'll go, man, if you know, it's just the prayer times are so if you would, you know, the preaching's great, but it's long and, and the prayer times, it's just like, well, what are we supposed to be doing in church? I mean, honestly, but you know, what's amazing. Our church fills up with young college students and we are like the farthest thing from what a college student church is to be. Because even them, the little young ladies in college who just got converted, recognize we don't want to do this. Or we came to know Jesus. Um, so and I'm not saying, OK, this is what you have to do. But what I'm saying is actually look at your church and ask yourself this question. Where did I learn this? Where did it come from? Can I, if I stood before the Lord right now and he said, give an account for why you do what you do, would I be able to go to scripture for each and everything? Would I? Why did you arrange, you know, 30 Sunday school classes in a church of 400 people? Did you, did I give you that many teachers? What, what, what are you doing? But that's the way it works. Hold it works. You're talking about pragmatism now, right? The, one of the deadliest There's heresy on one side, pragmatism on the other. Pragmatism is just working out heresy. <laughs> Do you see now if you say, oh, I need to make changes. No, no, no. Stop. Stop. Oh, zealous one. Let us put you in a cage. You, you, you don't do it that way. You start teaching. And also do recognize that there are larger churches. We're building an, a building because we've always rented or met outside when they wouldn't let us rent. But our church is going to hold about 350 people. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that. Um, we're going to we'll plan another church somewhere with other elders that goes beyond that. 
But again, if God does raise up somebody in your town who's a marvelous expositor of the word and many people come around him, don't don't get all critical. You serve your master. Let him serve his. But with you men, I want to encourage you. It is a fearful thing to know that we will stand before Christ. With regard to his bride, I don't know how a man could sleep at night unless he knew that as far in good conscience I know, I've looked at the commands given to me with regard to the care of his bride and I'm trying to carry them out. That would be the only thing that would give me comfort. I mean, think about it. You see. Now let's look for a moment at and I just want to hit you with a bunch of things. Not it's not going to cure anything, but I want you to start thinking. Like, whoa, that's it's quite different missionary. What is a missionary? I mean, pastors all over the Bible, and we're not doing that even when it's clearly defined what a pastor is. What's a missionary? You find that word in the Bible anywhere? I don't. So do you see how unbiblical missions can get real quick? Everything from a clown ministry and juggling to spending $20,000, sending a bunch of carnal teenagers to paint a building and calling it missions. It's, it's, it's amazing that the word missionary is actually from Mitera. And uh, Mitera is the Latin of sent. Missionary, the Latin of missionarios. And both of those words are just tra Latin translations of the Greek. Every time you say he's a missionary, you're saying he's an apostle, because that's what it means. <laughs> The word missionary is the Latin word for apostle. It's a sent one. It was probably first used in the 16th century when the Catholic Church sent Jesuits up to north of Europe to try to put down the uh, Reformation. I'm not saying it's a bad term. You just need to know what you're talking about. So every time you say that person's a missionary, you're saying they're an apostle. Now, that's a kind of spooky So what is a missionary? Well, in the New Testament, I think that there are two uses of the word apostle. One are the apostles of Christ. They were the twelve. We can call them. We can use that number because that's the number that's used. The twelve. These were men that were chosen directly by Christ. They were sent out directly by Christ. And they received revelation from Christ. OK. They were sent by Christ. That's the twelve. But then there's another group twice they're mentioned. It's it's called messengers of the churches or messengers of the church or your messenger talking to a church. But literally, it's the apostle of the churches. Now. Here's what I want you to think about, because I want you to think about missions. Number one, when you when you define the word apostle for your congregation, you'll usually start by doing this. Now, the word apostle in the Greek and Latin world our Greek and Roman world referred to this, right? Someone sent out with authority. Well, Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> And when he used the word apostle, he didn't have to draw on Caesar. There's the sent one all throughout the Old Testament. Shaliach. The sent one. Did you know that during the time of Jesus, the Sanhedrin had a Shaliach, sent ones? Did you know that larger synagogues had a Shaliach, sent ones? Do you know what the ancient rabbis used to say? He who has spoken with Shaliach has spoken with the one who sent him. Now think about it. Jesus said, he who hears me, hears God. He, he spoke for God with God's authority. The Apostle Paul, he who hears us, hears Christ. Do you see that? Do you know even today in Israel, they have the Shaliach. Those in the Israeli government who have been commissioned to go out into the world and bring Jews back to Israel. 
with the authority to make promises. And so, so with the apostles, with the twelve, there are no more. They laid the foundation of the church. OK, they received revelation directly from Christ and they were sent out by Christ and their authority was supra ecclesiastical. They went out and started churches. They, they spoke over those churches. Well, though they don't exist anymore. So what do I believe that the, what we have? What is a missionary? He's a messenger of the church. He's a messenger of the church. He is sent out by the elders and the congregation. He is sent out only with the authority to, pro to proclaim the same truth that is believed by that congregation. And he is sent out to start another congregation of like faith. Now, do you see the importance of being an elder? <laughs> Because an elder is going to be watching over every bit of this. Is he qualified? Because if we lay his our hands on him. And he's not qualified, not only do we participate in whatever blessing comes from his ministry, we are responsible for every theological error and sin as elders. Do you see that? And so if I could redo mission education in the world, I would I would remove the department of missiology. <laughs> and what would I put in its place? Ecclesiology. Missions is just ecclesiology. And that is this. A biblical church with elder qualified men who have a degree of solemnity to them. Not that they're joyless men. But they have a grasp of the solemn stewardship that has been placed upon them and they shepherd that flock. Then what? They begin to look for, pray for Second Timothy 2 2 and trust these things to faithful men. Now, back in the 70s, that verse became the motto for what? One on one discipleship. That has nothing to do with one on one discipleship at all. It doesn't. I mean, it's it. One-on-one -on -one discipleship is good if you're a mature Christian, but it has nothing to do with one-on-one -on -one discipleship. It has to do with raising up elders. Raising up elder qualified men. Did you know this? As an elder, one of your responsibilities is to train and entrust the faith to other elder qualified men in your congregation. Did you know that? That is not given to a seminary. That is not given to a Bible college. It's given to you. And if you're not doing it, you're not carrying out your stewardship as a pastor. I was sitting on a platform with some pretty, I mean, smart guys. And I'm sitting there and I hear one of them goes, well, now when um, it's true, the mission agencies need to allow the local church to be more involved. I was like, OK. And then this other one goes, when you turn your, when you pastors turn your boys over to us to be trained. And finally, it was like. Can I say something? You don't let the church participate in your mission thing. The church tells you what to do. Secondly, no pastor would turn his boys over to any of you. In the same way that if my son and he is, he's studying in college right now, I didn't turn my, my son over to those teachers. Here's what I want you to see, men. It is the responsibility from Alpha to Omega for the elders of that church to be over the training of all men who seem to be called into the ministry. And if you do include someone from the outside, it's not because you read their impersonal doctrinal statement it's because, you know, those men. And you can draw from things like not every pastor is a renaissance man, so you may need to draw on someone who knows Greek or draw on this or that. Let them go to a seminary to some degree, but you never turn them over to anybody because there starts the journey. They get out of seminary. You don't really exist much anymore. Seminary gave them really good grades. And they start putting out their resume. What is that? 
What is that? It has nothing to do with Scripture. Do you see that? So you're over that man watching what he studies. But most importantly, he's got to live among you to know his character. All those character, non-negotiable character qualifications. And if any church were to call him without talking to you as an elder, you already know, son, be careful. That church didn't have a clue what the Bible says. They know nothing. And it'd be God's will to go there, but you're going to have a reformation on your hands because they just did something as absurd as possible. Or check this out. Guys pastoring the church for 18 months. I think that's how long they last now. And then he goes, I'm being called to another church. Hold it. You're hireling. You just left a flock. Now, if God's calling you to another church and you really believe that and that that can happen. Either you've trained men to replace you or you're going to wait until a man comes that you can actually know over a period of time. And that is not more. That's more than months. What you just turned over your flock? Is that what you did? Do you not see? Do you see how unbiblical we are, even though we say biblical, biblical, biblical? We're so far away from Scripture with church life that we we couldn't find biblical. You sit there and go, okay, I feel like I'm called. I I cannot come to you. I I do have an earnestness. Second Corinthians chapter eight. God had put an earnestness in Titus's heart. I have an earnestness to go there, but I'm going to hold my place. Until a man is here, I'd be a hireling just to leave them and then tell them, go find their own pastor. What I'm trying to do is give you kind of extreme examples that will do this. Man, I need to make sure that when I make a move or I do something in church, I need to really consult Scripture and not put a soup of verses together to confirm what you've already decided or to figure out how can I make this pragmatic thing work. But to realize, brother, this is the highest calling on earth is to be a pastor, an elder. They're over everything. They have to make decisions. And sometimes those decisions are based upon biblical principles and they have to apply them over a wide range of areas and they need great wisdom. It's not for a novice. Can a man be young and become a pastor? Yes. But one of the things depends on this. For example, we have a young man who's an an elder in our church. I think I've been in the ministry maybe as long as he's been alive. But he is an exceptionally wise young man. Sometimes he has to rein me in. And he was brought into an elder body of very wise men that have years and years and years. But just to send him off? No. Do you see? And so this elder thing is huge. And lays such responsibility on us. To study the scriptures. Can you imagine that maybe you've been put to care for the bride of Christ and you've never gone through the New Testament for God to show you what he commanded of you in that role? That's scary. When I used to go in the jungle, my wife, man, she is as tough as anybody. And she always wanted to go in the jungle, go in the jungle. And sometimes she would. But sometimes there would be red zones or places where I knew there was a lot of military activity and those men can be really corrupt. And I would say, no, you can't go. Well, why? Well, if they pull me off a bus and push me around and throw me against the thing and try to scare me and everything. That's like been there, done that. I don't care. Knock yourself out. But if one of those men touch you, it's all over. Now it turns into something completely different. And I want to live a few more years to minister. You see, you don't touch a man's wife. Do you know why God gave us wives? 
There's a whole bunch of reasons. You know, he can do a billion things in one thing. But one of them is to show his zeal for his bride. You, you touch, I'm going to stop you. Now, I will at first try to get you in an arm bar, but if that doesn't work, I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to try to stop you. That, that's my wife. Or these are my children. My little, I'm almost 60 and I have a five-year-old and she got bit by a spider and couldn't come. Like I'm calling every three hours. Is it brown recluse? Is it growing? You see, what? she's my heart. You could walk up and punch me in the face and really no big deal. My wife, my little daughter. No, no, no. No. God gave us that. So you have been put over the bride. And your job is not to hold together the kingdom. That is not your job. Your job is not even to make the kingdom grow. You pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Your command, Stuart, is only to obey. That is it. That's all you're called to do. That's it. But you've got to know, if he told Moses, with, I think Moses trembling, you be careful. Everything that was shown you on that mountain, you build it exactly like it was shown to you. And that thing was only a shadow, a type of a bride. Of a bride. The most precious thing to Christ. Now let me say one last thing. I hear men all the time going, I love the church, I love the church, I love the church, I love the church, 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 I love the church. But when you look at their lives, they don't love the church, they love their ministry in the church. There's a big difference. It's a tremendous difference. How much do you love the church? I'll tell you how much you love the church. How much do you love the most difficult, non-growing believer in your congregation. That's how much you love the church. Or I'll, I'll talk to uh, like missionary uh, guys that are about to go out on the field, you know, for some different missionary organizations and stuff. And I'll start off with and, and they're good theological men. So I'll start off with, OK, what are you going to do when you get to the field? I mean, what's your plan? Well, and they're all church planners because that's what missionaries do. They evangelize, they church plant. How do you plant a church? The same way you pastor one. You don't need strategies. <laughs> Just need the Bible. But all of them will say the same thing. Well, I'm going to go into the country. I want to plant a church. And then from that church, I want to plant other churches. You say, well, that's. What's wrong with that? Everything. You said, I thought you were about church planting. I am. But just think for a moment what you're saying and how it can get you off, very off. I'm going to plant a church so that using this church, working through this church, I can plant another church and another church and another church. Brothers, that's not why you plant a church. You plant a church because you love those people. And you want to feed them and you want them to grow. That's why you plant a church. If you plant a church in order to use that church as a means of planting another church, guess what? In time, you're going to become embittered against your church. Why? Because most of them aren't going to cooperate with your vision. You're going to spend most of your time just trying to keep marriages together. You're going to spend so much time discipling wayward children. You're going to spend so much time with people. It's literally the same question and the same problem for the last 20 years. And you're going to become embittered and angry and everything. Why? Because they're not cooperating with your vision. You have big things planned. So why do you start a church? You start a church because you love those people. And you want to feed those people. But, brothers, if you will. See, here's the thing. The kingdom is so invisible. It's so unapparent that if you will, I guarantee you, a man who has pastored 50 people faithfully, 
loving them, preaching the truth to them, rebuking them, visiting them in the hospital, encouraging them, saving them time and time again. That in the end, his life will have impacted the kingdom of heaven far more than the visionary. If I hear the word vision one more time, there's two words I can't stand. One of them's vision, the other one's radical. I don't like either one of those words. Well, where there is no vision, the people perish. That happened to be referring to the law. Where there are no revealed commands of God's will, the people run unrestrained. It has nothing to do with your vision. Do you see, bro? I want to exalt. I want to so exalt because it's biblical to do so, the position of a pastor. But with that exaltation of that ministry to also demonstrate how fearful it is. It is a fearful thing. And I see so-called pastors throwing people into the ministry. Throwing people to the mission field, laying their hands on people as though they, you know, they fear not God. They're the same who would, they're not like Uzzah trying to steady the ark. They're wanting to peer inside. And so just, just look at this. You're going to be held accountable for the way you treat the bride of him who comes from Bosna. He, the one whose robe is covered in blood. And at least part of that blood's from his enemies. You're responsible for his bride. And sometimes I am so amazed on how the Lord will test me. And it's frightful in that you're tired and, and all these, you know, big, important speakers all want to go to dinner and you haven't had any fellowship. You've been pouring yourself out for four days in a conference and here's all your heroes going to dinner. And then all of a sudden, some little man who just came to the United States from Ghana comes up to you and goes, I really need help. Can I talk to you? And you're like. And you're making a choice right there. And it's Christ who's laying it before you. You're going to minister to me. Or are you going to go? Eat with the big boys. What are you going to do? Do you see? Has he done? He's done that to you, hasn't he? Every difficult person, every person who doesn't contribute to your ministry, but holds you back, every person that wastes your time. What are you going to be? What are you going to be? Oh, well, I haven't been able to teach you much, but what I wanted to do was shake up the water. Shake up the water. And it is so easy to be on fire. Zealous preaching and everything, and yet you're doing so much that is a zeal without knowledge. And I know that's one other thing, man. Like I, I talked about the the Heidelberg. I think it was either the Heidelberg or the Belgic, in which I had worked for so many years to try to understand biblical assurance of salvation. Only one day to read one of the confessions and realize the whole thing was lined out there in about 20 concise statements. Um, that's why I read old books. Old books of churchmen. Churchmen. OK. And so I, I hope is there any question before we go? OK, everybody's like. Whoa. Uh, but I hope this is helpful. Let's pray. Father, thank you. And I thank you, Lord, that there are men here. Seated, Lord, that have that know the things I've said better than I do and have lived them out for many years. But Lord, especially the young men, help them not to get help them to make these men their example and not the movers and shakers who will not last, Lord, when you shake things. Oh, dear God, that they just be submitted to Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen.